many of you know where that song comes from? Anybody? Psalm 51. How many know what it's in response to? It's uh, David's affair. Uh, king David, who is uh, the most well-known king uh, of Israel uh, at one point in his life, uh, fell very, 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 very far down the ladder uh, in his spiritual journey and um, ended up having an affair illicitly. Uh, and then there's a whole lot more into that story. Um, but to bring it back around in a really succinct way, God did restore David. And that psalm, Psalm 51, was really a prayer of his heart. And that song is really a song of restoration. Uh, that's going to be important, I think, uh, and I'm going to come back to that story today. We are in the middle uh, of... Uh, sermon series called Living a Countercultural Life. You see it there on the screen. And um, our journey through uh, living a countercultural life is coming from Matthew chapter 5, where we are working through Jesus' sermon on the mount. Uh, that is a, a common way to refer to it. It is one of five sermons within the context of the book of Matthew uh, that Jesus gave, but we are working our way through this particular one because it has some really deep and relevant uh, application to our personal lives. Um, and uh, it just sets the tone a lot for what Jesus meant when uh, he came and he lived this life in, in the way that we are supposed to be living a, a kingdom-related life. And so uh, we've been working our way through it, and uh, I invite you to turn to Matthew chapter 5. Our verses today are going to be coming from uh, Matthew chapter 5, verses 27 through 32. Um, not very easy verses to tackle today. Uh, we're going to do so as uh, delicately as we can. Um, it's not a bad thing that our youth are away on a retreat today, I'll just say that. Um, we do still have some youth here, but that's great, uh, that's fine. Uh, it's going to be, it'll be appropriate, all right? So it'll be, it'll be good. Um, but the question uh, that I have there is really the title for our message today, and that is, have I crossed a line? Uh, I think it'll make some sense as we work our way through this particular passage together. Let's just review really quickly, and I just want to leave a couple of thoughts in your minds as we kind of progress from where we've been to where we're heading. Uh, first of all, let's just, this key thought, kingdom-minded folks live differently. That's just, that's what this whole series is about. If we are belonging to the kingdom of God, if, and, the, and the kingdom that is among us now, we are to live differently. Amen? So kingdom-minded folks live differently. We've kind of called that counter-culturally. How do we understand the world that we're living in? How do we live differently? That is kind of the essence of this sermon series. Uh, how do we live in opposition to a culture that tells us to do certain things certain ways? How do we embrace certain things? How do we reject certain things? It's really the goal of this sermon series. So here's another key thought as we're working our way through it today. Uh, and that key thought is, God wants my heart. Can you just look to somebody next to you and say, God wants my heart? All right, God wants my heart. And what we're looking at today is uh, the second and the third of six particular statements where Jesus says to the people, you have heard that it was said. All right, so we're looking at the second and the third of those particular statements where he is not only affirming the law, all right? He's affirming what went before, but he's saying what went before and what's being practiced now, they're, they just, they're incompatible. They're not working together. And so you've heard that it was said they're contrasting statements. All right? It's a righteousness according to the law. There's one way to become righteous. I can live by the rules. Or there is this what uh, is known as the new dikeosune, and I unpacked that for you. That's a Greek word that means the new righteousness. It's a righteousness that exceeds that of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. It's living above the rules, living in the spirit of the rules, if you will. All right, so that's what we're really getting to. And really the point, again, for today is that uh, as in all of these particular statements, you can follow the Bible, you can follow biblical rules, and not have a kingdom heart. Amen? You can follow the rules and not have a kingdom of heart. You can live by the rules. You can still not belong to the kingdom of God. And that's really what Jesus was pointing out as he was talking to the people on the hillside. 
And really, I think it may be one of the biggest stumbling blocks for people outside of the church when they look at the people of the church, or they look at the church, right? That when they look at us and they don't see us living the way Christ intended for us to live, why do I want that? What do you have to offer that's different than what I'm living in the way that I'm living in the rest of the world? So in these particular verses, I would suggest that if we're only following the rules, we're missing the point. Again, for today, God wants my heart. Say it to yourself. God wants my heart. And here's another one you can say to yourself, and that is, if I'm only following the rules, I'm missing the point. All right, so that's really kind of where we are as we kick off these particular verses today. And and lest anybody think that this particular passage is out of touch with reality, uh, anybody familiar with the Me Too movement? Um, You know, one of the... one of the hardest ones for me to uh, hear about was when Matt Lauer came out and, and, and he was fired from the Today Show. I'd watched Matt Lauer for 20 years. Anybody else watch Matt Lauer on the Today Show? Um, to hear about the way he lived his life, behind the scenes and off camera. Charlie Rose was another one. Like, Charlie Rose? Really? And the list just goes on and on and on and on. This is the world that we live in, right? I don't need to give you tons of statistics, but I did come up with one or two that were just really like, whoa, like as if we needed to be reminded. But you know that one in three people today, all people, one in three people seek out porn one time a month or more? One third. I mean, just look, two people down from you in your row. One in three. Like, the the likelihood, right? The likelihood that it exists within our church is is super high, right? I'm not suggesting that the third person down does that, but (laughs) that's the stat. That's the statistic involved there, right? How about this one? Only one in three teens or young adults, so that's 13 to 24, only one in three actually think that porn is a negative thing. While one in two, that's 50%, 50% of adults, that's 25 and older, actually view porn negatively, what is that suggesting to us? That the younger generation has a whole different view of sexuality, and it's being pounded into them on a daily basis through the music and the advertisements and the TV shows and the internet and all that kind of stuff. There's this generational gap that is growing as it relates to understanding the impact of pornography. Rates of divorce, we're going to talk about that a little bit later. Rates of divorce are really not that much different. They are a little bit different, but not that much different between those who are in the church and those who are outside of the church. All of this is swirling all around us. And if you compare, or if you put this together with, not compare, but put it together with what Jesus was talking, what we talked about last week with this issue of anger, Why are you so angry? You get this whole idea of sex and violence. Sex and violence. That's what permeates our culture. You've heard those two things as it relates to movies, the things that we watch, the the things that we see and uh, we view for entertainment. Sex and violence. Why does Jesus start in with this life-transforming message? Why does he start right there? Why does he talk about anger? Why does he now move into sexual fantasy and lust and all of that sort of stuff and moving his way into this idea of adultery and divorce because it's so rampant and it's, there's nothing new. It was as rampant in his day as it is in our day and it might be a little bit more obvious in our day because of the media and, and the other ways that we access it but suffice it to say, right, it's as big a deal today as it was then. Sex and violence. That's what he's dealing with. That's what he's working his way through. So you have heard that it was said. So let's just start right there. Verse 27. Uh, I'll just read it again. Uh, In the NIV it says, You have heard that it was said. In the NLT it says, You have heard the commandment that says. So what's going on here in these particular verses as he begins? You have heard that it was said. Jesus has already declared that the law isn't what is bad, right? 
He said, I have come to fulfill the law. So it's not the law that's, that's bad. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. That's not what's going on here. He's not walking back from that. It's still wrong to commit adultery. But what is he doing here? He's saying that the, observ the observance of the law is not in question. It's the fact that observing the law, apart from it, flowing from a heart of love for God, gives us a false sense of righteousness. So we can follow the law, and we can follow the letter of the law, but if that law, if we don't have the intent of the law wrapped up in our hearts, then we have a false sense of righteousness. We don't want that. We want a new righteousness, a righteousness that exceeds that of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. So what did Jesus know in this case was adultery was not permitted, right? You've heard that it was said you should not commit adultery. Adultery was not permitted. You can go back to Deuteronomy, which is in the Old Testament. That's where some of these laws are articulated. You can read in chapter 22. Uh, you can make a note of that. Go back to chapter 22. You can read all about the laws that were involved with adultery. You could be put to death for an act of adultery. In fact, both persons could be put to death, whether you were complicit or not. So adultery was something that could be punishable by death. And what had happened is that the, the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, the, the ones that were following the law now, they basically interpreted that and said, basically, as long as I don't have sex with somebody outside of marriage, I'm good. That's adultery, right? That, that's the strict definition of adultery. And Jesus is coming along. You've heard that it was said you should not commit adultery, but what do I tell you? Well, Jesus knew that it wasn't good for them, right? But what he also recognizes is that that didn't give men in particular, and probably uh, mostly the people that he was talking to in this Sermon on the Mount were a large group of men, but at any rate, it didn't cause them to have to treat their wives especially well. It didn't cause them to have to cherish their wives. Basically, they had license to kind of look around and take things in and kind of whatever. In fact, there is a, a, a law, and you can read about it in the Old Testament in Deuteronomy, that basically if, if you see somebody else that you like better, well, then just give your wife a certificate of divorce and let her go, and you can go marry that new person because you thought she looked a little bit nicer. And that was the essence of what the law had been boiled down to. So were they following the letter of the law? Yeah, but it wasn't necessarily healthy. It wasn't good. It wasn't what God intended. Just because you have or don't have sex outside of marriage doesn't mean your heart is a kingdom heart. We've said that already. It might be like saying that uh, I'm a race car driver because I watch NASCAR, right? Or, or how about more specifically, I, I'm a Christian because I go to church. Right? I follow the rules, but I'm not really living the rules. I can act the part, and I can miss the point. That's what Jesus is talking about right here. I can act the part, and I can miss the point. You're not truly loving your spouse if you're having sex in your mind with every attractive person that you meet. You know, usually the only thing that's holding people back from acting out their fantasies is the possibility of being found out. I think there would probably be far more affairs and, and more adultery in our world today if those who are enticed in their minds thought that they could actually get away with it without consequence. It's really what makes internet porn so ubiquitous in our day. It's become a thing that you can do relatively anonymously. And therein lies the deception. And the fact that it's really about our heart. Because God sees it all. Nothing is hidden. But somehow we discount his watchful eye. How? Why? I mean, it's really beyond me. I don't understand it myself. And I'm not casting any, pointing any fingers. I'm, I'm pointing the finger at myself. How do we... How do I discount God's watchful eye and think that somehow I could be getting away with something? Job knew that God sees it all. 
And in Job chapter 31, verses 1 to 12, you can hear a very interesting account of what Job's view of adultery and sexual immorality was. I'm just going to read for you the first four verses. He says this, I made a covenant with my eyes not to look lustfully at a young woman. For what is our lot from God above, our heritage from the Almighty on high? Is it not ruin for the wicked, disaster for those who do wrong? Does he not see my ways and count my every step? Job. Job knew. God's watching. God's watching. There's nothing that's outside of what he sees. And we're only fooling ourselves if we think we're getting away with it. So Jesus confronts this law by getting to the heart of the matter, and and that is that actions are precipitated by what's in our hearts already. Following the law, my intent, without understanding the intent of the law, misses the mark. Jesus says elsewhere in Mark chapter 7, verses 21 to 23, he says this, For it is from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All of these evils come from inside and defile a person. It's out of our heart that all of this stuff is happening. Say to yourself, God wants my heart. Let's just look real briefly. Why does, or when does, when does adultery happen? It says, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you, anyone that looks at a woman lustfully, and in many translations you hear, with lustful intent, and that is really the the essence of what we're going to talk about here is with intent. But when does it happen? And for this, I am going to point back to the story of David and Bathsheba, right? So let me just tell you just briefly a little bit about that story for those of you that aren't familiar with it. Uh, It says, and you can read about it in 2 Samuel, which is in the Old Testament as well, 2 Samuel chapter 11. It says, in the days when the kings went off to war. That's kind of how it starts out. It's a great way to start a story. In the days when the kings went off to war. It gives this picture of a season when they were uh, supposed to go out. The armies were going out, and they were going out for conquest and battle and and whatever it was. There was a, a season almost that was set aside for that kind of purpose. But what did King David do in that particular season? He sent his commanders out, and he didn't go with them. He decided to stay back. For whatever reason, the scripture isn't really clear about that doesn't really say why did he stay back, but it just says in this particular season, when the kings went off to war, David was at home. David stayed back. Doesn't say he was sick, doesn't say he was injured, doesn't say anything. Just somehow implying that David should have been off to war, and he wasn't. He was sleeping one night, and in the course of that particular night, he couldn't sleep. Something woke him up, or he just couldn't sleep. Maybe he was feeling a little guilty. I don't know, right? You can can read between the lines. But something's going on, and he can't sleep. So he gets up, and he's walking around the roof of his palace, it says. He's walking around, and he notices a young woman. Now, you'd probably have to understand the geography and the layout of how houses worked in that particular period of time, but they're, you know, tightly packed, you know, and people kind of did a lot of stuff on their roofs and, and whatever. So, you know, he's, being, he's able to look over, and, and for whatever reason, he sees this young woman. Her name happens to be Bathsheba, and she's bathing, and he's attracted. Now, if it had stopped right there, many, many chapters of the Old Testament would not have had to have been written. Amen? But it didn't stop there. He not only saw her, he was aroused by her, he inquired of her, he learned about her, he invited her to the palace, and the rest is history, and you can read more about it in the Old Testament. But for our purposes today, what constituted adultery. First of all, when I'm not doing what I'm supposed to be doing, there's sort of this anatomy of a process that leads into 
adultery and illicit activity. When I'm not doing what I'm supposed to be doing, David was supposed to be off to war, instead he was at home. And he wasn't doing what he was supposed to be doing. How many of us find ourselves in a place oftentimes where we get tempted and we wonder why we get tempted, but instead of uh, blaming God, we should be pointing the finger back, what should I have been doing in that moment instead with my time? Thing, the second thing is when we dwell on thoughts and experiences and we don't move on. It wasn't terrible that he saw Bathsheba bathing. He couldn't have predicted that his walking around would have encountered that particular experience. But when he dwelled on that experience, when he took it to the next level, that's when things went downhill. And the third is when we move beyond thoughts into taking action. What I want you to notice is what adultery isn't. So adultery is not seeing something and being interested or even noticing attractive people. You can't predict those experiences. You, if you walk around the world, if you are interactive with the world around you, you will see things, and you can't predict when those things are going to turn you on or turn you off. or what. You, you don't know that, right? Adultery is not the the interaction with people and kind of being turned on or turned off. That's, that's not adultery. So be very clear about that. You haven't crossed the line when you just see things that you couldn't have predicted, all right? This is what adultery is. Adultery is when you intend to do it. When you pursue those experiences, when you go looking for them, you have now crossed the line, when you set out to experience or find pleasure in someone, and it could be through fantasy, primarily often in our day and age it is through fantasy, you've crossed the line. When you look at a woman lustfully, when you look, women, at a man lustfully, that's with intent to pursue something either in your mind or physically. I think the range of activity that falls under this particular idea ranges from uh, casual glances. You notice somebody, but rather than kind of acknowledging and moving on, you, now you, you start, your eyes start to move in places they shouldn't move, right? and those casual glances or those second looks or whatever it is, right? So it can range from something like that all the way to, all right, now I'm going and I'm actually looking for this stuff. I turn on the TV or I open up the internet or whatever. I'm actually looking now to have this experience. And of course, not to diminish the actual act of adultery, in a day and age where so much of what we constitute as relationships is about what I feel, and if I feel it, I should pursue it, and that ranges whether I'm married or I'm not married. If we're all about pursuing things based upon our feelings, we're very quickly getting into an area where we're crossing the line. Because it's not about our feelings in that sense. What we're really desiring is an intimacy with someone, and it's an intimacy that God modeled for us through the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's an intimacy that is related to mutual submission. It's an intimacy that's related to mutual respect. It's an intimacy that's related to loving somebody more than you love yourself. And what we're pursuing is a false intimacy when we're pursuing something in a fantasy world, when we're pursuing somebody that's not our spouse, when we're pursuing something that is illicit and we know it, if we intend that, we have then crossed the line. So let's just be really clear. It's the intent. It's what I plan for that's at the heart of the matter. So here's a heart check moment for you. If you're married, let's think about this. Do you desire your wife or do you desire your husband because of a deep intimacy between you? Or is your relationship rooted in playing out fantasies and filling sexual desires? That's the heart check for you. Where's your heart in that moment? And if you're not married, 
What are you looking for in a relationship? Culture would tell you it's about romance and how you feel in the moment. The Bible tells us that the heart is deceitful and what we feel cannot be trusted. You can read about that in Jeremiah. We must temper what we feel with things we learn and know from the Bible. So if you're not married, what's the basis of your relational pursuits? The culture or the Bible? So let's just review really quickly. It's not the law that was bad. Adultery is wrong. It's just that by pursuing a a legalistic approach to not committing adultery, you haven't necessarily touched your heart. And God cares. God wants your heart. Amen? So what's this whole piece in here? And and we're going to move in real quickly to uh, some difficult understanding. It says... um, So if your eye, even your good eye, causes you to lust, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your hand, even your stronger hand, I'm right-handed, that's why I'm holding it up, causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. What's going on with those particular verses? In fact, Jesus actually quotes those verses again or uses those same words again over in Matthew chapter 18 and a couple other places in the New Testament. Jesus uses those verses. What is he trying to say? Number one, he's trying to say that, yes, it is so important for you to know who God is that if that's what it takes, do it. But the reality is he's kind of making a claim to point out the absurdity of following the law to the letter of the law without capturing your heart. Because, for instance, if I took out my eye, does it mean that I can't lust with my left eye? No, right? So, so I got to take out my left eye, too. Now I can't see. Does that mean I, I can't lust with other parts of who I am, right? Particularly my mind? Have I changed anything about my heart just by gouging out eyes and cutting off hands? No, Dallas Willard says you could enter eternity uh, a maimed stump without really knowing who God is. It, It would be absurd to gouge out your eyes and cut off your hands and all of that sort of stuff. If that's what it takes, do it. But that's not the heart. You haven't changed your heart. And so it would be absurd to try and just continue to follow the letter of the law. Notice, I I don't notice any of you that have cut off your right hand or gouged out your right eye. Something intuitively says that's not exactly how we should interpret those verses, right? And that's what I'm telling. I think that's what Jesus was getting at, is you can't follow the letter of the law here without allowing God's Love to permeate who you are and to change the way that you think. And that's really at the essence of what he's getting at with these particular verses. So those are some difficult verses, and, and you can wrestle with them a little bit more. Um, but I'm going to move on because Jesus now takes this concept of adultery, and he takes this idea of uh, it starts with the mind and the heart, and, and you can follow the letter of the law and still be outside of my will. And he moves it into this idea of divorce. And this is a very sensitive subject for a lot of us. But I think he does this quite naturally. I think it flows because really what is at the heart of so many divorces that people go through? What he's already talked about. Anger. Contempt. Unfulfilled expectations. Lust-driven sexual experiences, lust-filled fantasies about life with somebody else. Right up there is the cause is adultery and illicit affairs. Why do so many people experience divorce? Because hearts grow hard. Hearts grow hard toward one another. You've got anger. You've got sexual lust and fantasies and all these things. And marriages break down. I want to be clear before I move on that the Bible never says that an affair actually has to lead to to a divorce. The Bible doesn't say that. 
It often will, and it often does, because those moments are very difficult, and they're tragic, and they're hard to work through, but it doesn't have to. So let's not misread what Scripture says. It will often and probably always leave a permanent scar. But sometimes those scars are actually better, believe it or not, than continuing to live in the hurtful situations that this world can put on people. And that's actually, I think, part of what Jesus is getting at here. So let's just review really quickly again. What does Jesus know? Uh, He says in verse 30, You have heard that it was said, uh, a man can divorce his wife merely by giving her a, a notice of divorce. You can go back to Deuteronomy chapter 24, and you can read about where uh, this particular law comes into place. But I say to you that a man who divorces his wife, unless she has been unfaithful, causes her to commit adultery. And anyone who marries a divorced woman also commits adultery. So what does Jesus know? He knows that the law, at least, that he was talking about required for a certificate of divorce to be given. But why? Why was a certificate of divorce particularly required? Because really I think in this particular case, women were particularly vulnerable, very vulnerable in that particular day and age. In fact, uh, when a woman got divorced, she probably had one of three particular options available to her. One was she could be taken in by a relative. And that would have to be somebody who uh, lovingly embraced her because she would have been ostracized and had a stigma attached to her just by virtue of her divorce. So a relative would have had to take her in, and she still would have probably had this stigma attached to her regardless for the rest of her life. She probably would not have been able to have any more children, likely, if she was not married again. Um, The second option is she could have been, she could get married again, but there's always going to be a stigma associated with it. So she, in some cases, with this new husband, would have had even a second-class kind of status within her own marriage because of the stigma of divorce. And the third thing that could have happened to her is she could have been ostracized completely from the community. The only way for women in that particular case to make a a living would have been through through prostitution. So a woman in this particular case was confined to some very, very negative realities with this issue of divorce. At least the certificate of divorce showed that she wasn't necessarily complicit in the process. It gave her a little bit of credibility in the eyes of the community. That's what the certificate was supposed to do. But really, what Jesus knew about the heart of men in particular in this case was their hearts were hard. The law wasn't necessarily written for women. It was, in many cases, abusive towards women. It was primarily written to absolve the men. Um, It was a legal process, but it really didn't get to the heart of that relationship, that marital relationship. So that's what Jesus knows. That's what's going through his mind as he's talking to the people about this issue of divorce. You can give them a certificate of divorce, yes, but... Now let's go back, and he points back now. When you do, you're subjecting that woman or that man and yourself to this idea of adultery. What is adultery? It's the intent of the heart. So a couple of things we want to make some distinctions about. Um, There's a reason why it was allowed, and I just explained it to you. Jesus even affirmed it. Um, Moral impropriety. Uh, When somebody goes out and commits adultery inside of your marriage, you have, according to the law, a legal ground, the law of God, the Old Testament law. You have grounds for a divorce. So Jesus didn't say it was never permissible. He just says this is a, a the case, this is the rare case, and and in Matthew chapter 19, if you want to go over there and look at that, the the Pharisees presented him with a question, and it says, is it lawful to divorce your wife in this particular case, but it could be uh, mostly men divorcing their wives, is it lawful in every circumstance? That's what the question was, 
And there were two schools of thought at the time, and one school of thought said yes, like the Jewish leaders of that school of thought said yes, under any circumstance, and that was the circumstance I referenced earlier. If I see somebody else that I actually like more, I'll just give my current wife a certificate of divorce and you're absolved, you're good, go on with your life. That was one school of thought, any reason. The other school of thought was what Jesus landed on, and that was no, not for every reason, but certainly in the case of moral impropriety, because what is he talking about there? He's getting to, there's intent to harm, there's intent to abuse, there's intent towards selfishness in this particular case. So he makes the point that there's a reason why in some cases divorce has been allowed. He says that in Matthew 19. There's a reason why Moses allowed you to do it, and he says very clearly, some of you will know it, why did Moses allow you to do it? Because your hearts were hard. Think about it. What has he talked about? Anger, now lust, now getting into the idea of divorce. It's all a matter of the hardness of our hearts. If you got rid of anger and selfishness, if you got rid of lust and sexual fantasies and all that stuff, imagine what kind of a place the world could be. Just those two issues, sex and violence, change our perspective on all of that and imagine what the world could look like. Jesus points back to, when he's explaining all of this, he points back to Genesis, the very original creation account. He points back to Genesis and he says, you know, when God made them male and female and the male went to the female, they left their father and the mother and the two became one. What is he saying? And he's pointing all the way back. Number one, he's affirming the creation account. Let's just give acknowledgement to the fact that Jesus himself points all the way back to the creation account. Number two, he's affirming the bond between a man and a woman as the context for marriage. So he's pointing all the way back to Genesis to affirm men and women as the context for marriage. And he's doing so in the context of for life. There is a rhythm that God created from the beginning of creation. Men and women are supposed to get together and they're supposed to create families, and they're supposed to procreate, and they're supposed to populate the earth, and they're supposed to subdue it, and all of that, there's a rhythm to this life. And divorce breaks that rhythm. That's what he's saying. Divorce breaks that rhythm. But Moses allowed you to do it because your hearts grew hard. And so there is something that makes divorce permissible, not necessarily good, in fact, not good. In fact, we read about it in other places in the Old Testament where God says, I hate divorce. But that doesn't mean that it's never permissible because your hearts were hard. I just hate it. It's not good for you. It's not what I had designed for you as people. I know that it's a terrible, terrible thing. But then he also ties it to adultery. It says here is difficult and it should be avoided, but then he ties it to adultery because he's talking about the idea of the hardness of our hearts. Some of you have been divorced, and I know that. And really, the process of going through that divorce, I'm sure, was excruciating. Beyond some people's ability to comprehend. And I'd love to stand up here, and I was wrestling with this, I'd love to stand up here and just give you a blanket statement and say, you know what, it was justified, it was right, and I can't do that, right? Jesus is clear that there are some cases where divorce is actually permissible, But you have to search your heart. What was your heart in the journey of leading to that particular experience in your life? And it's not as if the experience of divorce is not something you can overcome. It's not like it's the worst of all sins in the world or anything like that. It's it's one of those things that you have to search your heart and before God, is your heart clean? Is your heart pure? Or do you seek God's forgiveness in that journey and in that process. 
in many cases, I would believe that your divorce may have actually been justifiable. But I can't say that for everybody. But I'm willing to look at it with you if you're struggling with it, if you're wondering, where was my heart in this journey? And I'm willing to walk through a season with you of discernment and forgiveness. Maybe it's forgiveness for yourself. Maybe it's forgiveness of forgiving your spouse, your former spouse. Letting go of the anger and the bitterness that is pent up inside. It is something that we can recover from. It absolutely is. It's Jesus is looking at your heart. If you aren't divorced, never have been, but you're considering it, again, it boils down to the condition of your heart. What's going on in the depth of your heart? What's driving you to believe that that is your only course of action? Self-justification isn't the answer. But through godly counsel, Holy Spirit-inspired wisdom, it can be discerned what your motivation is in the journey and in the process. Yes, God hates divorce, and some people will hold that over your heads. God hates divorce, but that's just an abuse of the scripture. It's not fair to you who may be feeling completely overwhelmed with the circumstance that you're in. And we have to discern that together. Let's come alongside one another and let's prayerfully discern what's going on inside of our hearts. Yes, divorce is an awful thing. And anybody who's been through it will testify that it is an awful thing. But it's not an unrecoverable thing. It's not an irreparable thing in the sense of your relationship with God. You can be restored in that process. But if it can be avoided, it absolutely must but if it can't, it may be on the table as an option. But don't walk through that journey alone. Please don't walk through that journey alone. This isn't about just signing some papers and moving on. That's what Jesus was saying. You can give a certificate of divorce, but what's the intent of your heart? You know, and if you're not married, consider every relationship with special care. Why are you in that relationship? Does that other person know Jesus? Are they supportive of your faith journey? Do they respect and love you, not because of your body and your looks, but because of your soul? Are they willing to commit to you through thick and thin, beyond the feelings? So many questions to ask. Seek the counsel from people who are in successful relationships. I guarantee you they haven't been perfect. but they can tell you what it took to make it work. At least they can give you some clues. God wants your heart. It's the essence of what he's getting at in these statements. You've heard that it was said, but I tell you this. I want your heart. What's the intent of your heart? You can follow my law, but you can be way far away from me. What's the intent of your heart? I would encourage all of you to memorize Job 31, 4. That verse that says, is it not God who sees everything that I do? That's my paraphrase. Memorize Job 31, 4. You might even go back and memorize Job 31, 1. I made a covenant with my eyes that I would not look lustfully at a young woman. Or man. You've got to put this into action. If we are to be living counterculturally, if we are to be kingdom minded people, we have to put these things into action. We cannot just walk away from this feeling convicted, but do nothing. All week, I encourage you to pray Psalm 139 23 and 24. Search my heart. And know me. 
Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there be any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Search me, God. Search my heart. Search the intent of my heart. For it's not until I know the intent of my heart that I really know if my actions are justified. So the question again today, have you crossed the line? The answer is that yes, most of us have crossed the line. I really don't know anybody who hasn't crossed the line. I wish I did because I'd go seek my counsel from them. The issue really is not how close can we get to the line, but how far can we stay away from it, amen? So have we crossed the line? Yes. How can we get further away from that is checking the condition of our heart. Does God have all of it, or are you simply content with following rules and calling it a day? What's the intent of your heart? Jesus loves you. These are sensitive, sensitive subjects. But he wants to walk through it with us. Amen? And he says these things because he cares about you, because he cares about me. Kingdom-minded folks live differently. That's what this is all about. Are we living differently? Let's bow our heads, if you would, or just silently contemplate for a moment. Lord, I've asked myself this week, what's it going to take? What's it going to take for me to live this kind of life? What am I willing to let go of? How far am I willing to go to truly trust you with my life, my thoughts, and the intents of my heart? Lord, I know there are many thoughts swirling around in each of us today as we hear these words. You've heard that it was said, but, but you have told us it's not about following the rules. It's about capturing the intent of why that rule existed. You want nothing to be between you and us. And sometimes we make sex out to be an idol in our lives, and sometimes we make our relationships even out to be idols in our lives, and you want none of it. And sometimes we justify our actions because we say we're following the letter of the law, but we've missed the entire heart of it. And God, I pray that we would pray with David throughout this week. Search our hearts and know us. Test us and know our anxious thoughts, Lord. See if there be any offensive way in us. Continue to reveal it, Lord Jesus, because we want to live differently, even counterculturally. Let us not do the things the world does and call it okay. Please, Lord, help us to live differently by the power of your Spirit. Thank you. Amen. We're going to take a couple of minutes and just allow you to respond and react to what the Spirit is saying to you, and then the worship team will come, and you may have offerings to give or prayer cards to give. There's a basket here. And however you want to respond to the Lord today, recognizing who he is in your life, take some time right now and just allow the Spirit to minister to you and to respond accordingly.